Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp and welcome back. Today I wanted to follow up on a more visual representation of what I've gone over before. I just think it's so important to have this fundamental foundation of what we're talking about because this is something that will directly make you be healthier. And I started this series of videos about seasonal affecting disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, major depressive disorders, etc. To say how related that is, that is all true. Now we're going to go into some of the nitty gritty about this research we went over with Dr. Yertles. And to pull it back into our SNPs, our polymorphisms, and really go a little deeper into that on subsequent videos. Okay, so let's get to it. So we're looking at, as we talked about before, the three genomic bottlenecks, right? The three genetic bottlenecks that have to do with people's genes and particularly three genes that it's they're common mutations. And some of the mutations make that particular gene function very poorly. So we went over and we're going to look at it again, how there's a report and you can find out what your gene is and how good or bad it can function given the polymorphism, given the allele that it has. Okay. So you can find this out and I'm going to give you the big picture, break it down. We're going to go through this um, research and you'll find it very exciting. Right up your alley, I'm sure. Okay, so the three bottlenecks, MTHFR, MTRR, and CBS. I'm just referring to them by their acronyms this time. Um, I'm sure it gets a little bit tedious when you keep on hearing these long names. Okay, so this is the methylation cycle. These are three areas in which it can be uh, problematic. It can be an obstruction. So I talked about this being a traffic circle, a rotary, and traffic circle to traffic circle to traffic circle. And when you start having these genetic, genomic problems, these mutations that slow things down, it's really a compound problem. It's not just one mutation. Even if one just has one mutation, it's a backup and other aspects. So you can be having a problem over here and finding that it's over here is a problem, making neurotransmitters and turning them on and off. So this whole thing is called the methylation cycle. And what does methylation do? It, when you methylate a gene, you put it to bed, you make it quiet, you silence it. And when you unmethylate it or take away that methyl marker, that it then allows it to be function, allows it to be read and then produced. Okay. So unmethylated, it's going to be the active genes. They're going to be created, whether they're enzymes or whatever this is. And if they're methylated, they're going to be quieted. So we talked about the difference between liver tissue and my eye. And that's the same exact DNA, but certain genes are read to make my eye and certain genes are read to make my liver. And then other genes are quieted. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Good. Makes good sense, right? Okay, and then we went to a slightly different way of looking at the same thing. I'm, I'm trying to train you into these three little three ring circus ways of looking at the methylation cycle. Here's the same three enzymes, the same three mutations. Um, it has a global aspect. You have over 8 billion supposedly methylation reactions happening in your body. So it is a global process throughout your whole body of genes being turned on and turned off when it's appropriate and where it's appropriate. Okay, so now we go on to, and remember, we talked with talked about Dr. Yertle's uh, research in which he started with this thing called the agouti mouse. And the agouti mouse is really interesting. So agouti mouse is like a lot of lab research mice, that they were bred to be very specific. You know, so now you can get a mouse um, that has certain genes removed. And so they've been bred to be what knockout mice, and that's what they're, they're called. This is a different situation. So this agouti mouse is a generic, meaning it's been, it's been refined to have a problem. And so this problem is it's going to be obese, it's going to be diabetic, and it's going to be prone to cancers as it ages. And it has yellow fur. So that's the agouti mouse. It's, it's bred to be this way. All right. So obese, diabetic, yellow fur, cancer. All right, so what did Dr. Yertle do? He basically said, all right, I want two groups of female 
um, a goody mice. And before they conceive, before they get pregnant, we're going to feed them chow. And one group he's going to, which is mouse chow, mouse, mouse food, mouse kibbles, right? And so in one group, he's going to give them mouse chow, mouse kibbles, and methyl donors. So methyl donors, B12, folate, we talked about before, choline, trimethylglycine. And that's the only difference. So he basically gave some donors, some portions of the methylation cycle to make sure that their methylation cycle, their methylation process worked. All right, what did he get? So then they got pregnant and the subsequent children, kids, came out. Let me just actually go back a little bit. and I'll say, you know, this is what he offered. So in the methylation cycle, his methyl donors were these four things. There's the folate, your B12, uh, S-adenyl methionine, otherwise known as SAM or SAM-E, and then choline. These are the four things he had given for their methylation. So, so he wanted to make sure that their methylation cycle worked. We didn't know about the mouse chow. It was just regular food, probably just caloric, but there was nothing special about it. And the other, he said, let's give this. Pretty straightforward, pretty kind of just a thoughtful experiment, not real high tech, right? Again, these methyl donors you can get as supplements, which you should not get uh, without advice, but this is how common this is. This is what I'm trying to say. These are what you give, what they gave. They, they put it into the food, and you also could ideally do it with actual food if you knew that it actually contained these things. So, and so what, was the, what were the offspring like? Well, the offspring that had the methyl donors ended up being healthy, normal mice, which was phenomenal because the agouti mouse were bred to be abnormal, were bred to be diabetic, were bred to be obese, were bred to have cancer subsequently. That was it. You know, they, they were not just invented in early 2000s. They went back, well, I believe another 10 or 15 years previous. And there's thousands of different mice you can choose depending on what your experiment is. So he chose the agouti mouse. And yet, just four ordinary methyl donors turned the agouti mouse, obese, diabetic, yellow, and prone to cancer, into a normal mouse, changed its color, and made it a healthy, long-lived mouse. Okay, then. What are we saying? Function was restored to the whole methylation process. It could methylate. It could turn these genes on and off when it needed to. And, and basically, the piano is my analogy to a sophisticated situation in which you need to turn things on in a moment and turn it off, right? That's playing a piano. You want that sound and then off. That sound and then off. And so you can play your own song. So he restored the piano to a fully functioning piano, a fully functioning organism. That's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible, don't you think? Okay. Well, he went one further than that and started again with the same agouti mouse and said, okay, this is now 10 years later. He said, let's add a toxin. Let's add an environmental toxin, which is very well known that we now know, both now and current times in uh, 2021 and back then, that it had some negative effect on the methylation cycle, on the methylation process. Let's see what happens. So what he did, he took the agouti mice, A and B, gave them the same chow as before. He gave them both BPA, bisphenol A, which is a, a toxin that affects the methylation cycle. And as he did before, he also gave methyl donors uh, in the other group. So what did he get? So here's a BPA. BPA you see everywhere. As much as we know, if you were to go on Google and you look at BPA, we will in a second, uh, you'll see it's problematic across in, in many different things. And yet, it's still out there. It's still out there. So it's up to you to avoid it or not avoid it. But this is what BPA is. It's the polycarbonate bottles. Let me just go a little deeper. Here's some of the articles. It, this is just a quick scan in Google Scholar and uh, PubMed from some recent research. Here's 20, uh, 2019, 2020, 2020, gene expression, DNA methylation changes 
in the hypothalamus in the hippocampus of uh, adult rats. They uh, experiment on rats, you know, they experiment on humans. Bisphenol A and estradiol. Another one, bisphenol A induced epigenetic changes and its effects on male reproductive system. And that was in 20, that's 2020. Now another one is 2018. Parental bisphenol A exposure is linked to epigenetic changes, so on and so forth, in female rats. DNA methylone, why basically your DNA methylation process is, is affected by bisphenol A. And so that was from 2019 and 2019. So the point of me even showing this slide is that there is plenty of current research is saying, still saying, this is bad stuff. Um, the last two were about uh, male infertility being directly affected by bisphenol A. And some of you are probably thinking, oh yeah, there's toxins all over the place. I just can't be bothered anymore. Well, this is something you can choose to stay away from. We don't do it, you know, and it's not like a big act of discipline in our life. You just say, I don't do that anymore, you know, and you make other choices. And by the way, the other subsequent phthalates that are not, they say, B, uh, BPA-free, they're equally problematic. So don't be sucked into that. Okay, so again, these are the methylation donors, uh, the methyl donors. And what do we get? Same, same. We got a healthy mouse. So why? This is remarkable because this now speaks to detoxification. This speaks to helping the body be able to get rid of this toxin. This speaks to the body, the metabolism, to these methyl donors as being able to override the toxic effects of BPA. And so can we say, well, this is true of all toxins? No, we can't. You know, pesticides, uh, fungicides, herbicides, they're all very vast. And as much as they may act in a similar way, you can't say this uh, has to be researched to be able to support that sort of thing. And for the money to spend on showing that a pesticide or a fungicide or an herbicide or a plasticizer is a problem comes from where exactly. So it will probably not be shown, but this is something that's pretty profound, very profound if you ask me. So in the end, it restored its functionality again. You could play the piano. You could methylate the 8 billion times a second that you were supposed to methylate. So the question comes, does this work in humans? And are humans and mice the same? Now, it's very tempting. Everybody who watches this is going to say, yeah, I want to, I want to feel that mice and humans are the same in this aspect. So if we can change it for mice, we can change it for humans. Well, let me tell you, it's not quite that way. Uh, back in 2001, 2, and 3, when this research was coming out, that methyl donors were all the rage to just collectively do for humans what Dr. Yertle's experiments did for mice. Uh, that didn't work at all. It didn't work at all. Well, I was practicing then, and we would do that. And you would take uh, a product that would be product A, methyl donors, or a combination like this, and they would come back, patients would come back saying they feel awful. They just didn't feel great, you know, sleep. And so you didn't change much at all. So what you had to do, you had to go deeper, and you had to be with humans, more complicated, you had to look at what was their situation? You know, what were their polymorphisms? What were the alleles that they had, homozygous, heterozygous? What ones are the big problems that you should focus on? Should you focus on just one? And it's an ongoing story, by the way. There's no clean conclusion to this particular part, but you need to take one and focus, focus on it and have that be a marginal improvement then bring in others. You can't collectively go, and I'm going to give you all this stuff, all these supplements, because I saw this <laughs> rat research, and it worked for rats, so it should work for you. No, I can tell you, by my experience, that was not a good experience. But the thinking was in the right direction. So given that sort of thinking, you need to obviously work with somebody who knows what they're talking about. And these numbers, by the way, over here are where you can just punch into Google, and there's a thing called Snippopedia. Um, and it will tell you all what it's related to. But the ones that have the most research are 
are the genes, are the mutations, are the alleles that have to do with the methylation process. And the methylation process is a global process in your body, both for detoxification and for turning genes off and on. Very important. So we look at that person's report. And so that person's report would now look like this on the schematic we've seen before. Problem here, problem here, problem there. They clearly would need to have all these addressed to be addressed. So they would increase their glutathione and all these that's an antioxidant. It's a big deal. So this is how we pursue the same concept in humans. And this has been a facility I've seen change over the last 15 years. And it is so profound, this information that you can have now, before you'd have to write in a requisition for one particular gene. Like, I think this patient might have a mutation for this. A couple of weeks later, it would come back and then you'd work on that. Now you get full reports. Um, this is just three, these three genes, these three, this is actually two genes here, are a small portion of the overall report. And you call out what are the appropriate mutations that you could address that most likely are contributing to this person's particular problem. So for all of us, however general you want to look at it, if you have these genes and they are as severe as this particular person's situation who has a history of diabetes and addiction and um, dyslexia, that these are things you need to take seriously. You can intervene. We are going to talk next time about how this passes on from generation to generation, what to do about that, and other aspects to bring to bear on the whole methylation process to make sure it's working for you. So until then, take care.